Hello everyone, welcome to a new video, I'm your host Aslan Historian. Between the highlands of central Mexico and the plains of Texas sits a vast region, one dominated by dry and arid plains as well as mountain ranges, a region that academics have come to know as Arid America. This vast expanse of land has been home of numerous indigenous nations for millennia. Yet our understanding of this region has been, historically speaking, pretty limited. The reason behind this limitation is simple. This land didn't see the rise of any major autochthonous urban societies in pre-Columbian times, and that has made it pretty uninteresting for European-minded academics, from the Spaniards to the Americans. For the people of central Mexico, these lands were a hostile wasteland, whose inhabitants were the very incarnation of barbarism an idea that persisted until very recent times as raids by nomadic peoples kept coming out of this region as late as the 1850s. This historically hostile relationship with the region also helped to cultivate a deep disdain for the region's natives, whose colloquial name, Chichimeca, came to be the familiar name of this vast region, the Gran Chichimeca. This name, based on a pre-Columbian Nahua word, has been the source of endless arguments and misunderstandings in academia, politics and pop culture. And today we are going to explore the historical origins and evolution of this charged and controversial term. Time to discover the real Chichimeca. The Hunters, the Invaders and the Translators First of all, we need to state something up front. Our understanding of the Chichimeca is heavily distorted by European concepts and cosmogony. This is because the sources from which our understanding of these peoples comes from were written way after the Spanish takeover of central Mexico. Now, while it's true that the Chichimeca were mentioned in one of the few pre-Columbian Nahua sources that still survive, the Codex Boturini or Migration Scroll, the truth is that this document only focuses on explaining genealogical traditions among Nahuatl speakers, and doesn't really describe the Chichimeca as a group nor as a culture. Those descriptions come from later works by Spanish missionaries and Christianized Nahua authors. In fact, this problem isn't exclusive to our understanding of the Chichimeca, it is also something we see when trying to understand another equally fuzzy and widespread concept in pre-Columbian history, that of the Toltec. But that topic is so wide and complex on its own that it actually deserves its own video. It would be great if someone could help me explain that. Did someone say Toltecs? Hello, Ancient Americas! Hey, Atzalan Historian! Sorry to interrupt you, but I've been doing a lot of reading on the Toltec legacy and have been fascinated by how confusing and contradictory it is. Oh, certainly it is. And how well has your research on them been going? What can you tell us about them? Well, the Toltec occupy a very unusual place in Mesoamerican history and... Actually, I don't want to hijack your episode, so why don't you and your viewers come over to my channel and check out my video I just made on the Toltecs that explores the legacy of one of Mesoamerica's most important cultural traditions. But before that, I want to learn more about the Chichimeca, so please continue. Oh sure, we'll continue doing that, but before we do, I really, really recommend everyone to go and watch Ancient America's video on his channel. It will be awesome. And now, let's go back to the video. So, as we mentioned earlier, the concept of Toltec has a complex history, and it isn't an intact relic from pre-Columbian times, and the same goes for the concept of Chichimeca. So what's a Chichimeca? The very term Chichimeca or Chichimec is subject of a long-standing controversy, as many possible etymologies have been offered for the word over the centuries, including children of dogs, eagle people, or even rob suckers. Although it has to be said, most of these proposals were made by authors who were completely removed from the Chichimeca in time and place, like Jerónimo Boscana and others. Other authors, like colonial Aztec historian Fernando de Alvarado de Sosomoc, tell us that Chichimeca was a term to designate, quote, fearsome people from the hills. But they don't explain the origin of the name. 
closely in time to Tesosomoc is the work of Diego Durán, a Spanish friar who stated that Chimeca means, quote, hunter or one who lives from hunting. In his famous work, Historia de las Indias de Nueva España e Islas de Terra Firme. This last proposal actually makes a lot of sense, given what we know about most of the peoples that have come to be known as Chichimeca. But the truth is that said name has been given to many different, completely unrelated ethnic groups in pre-Columbian, colonial and modern times. And as we'll see later, thinking of the Chichimeca as anything resembling a cultural unity or historical continuity would be done right wrong. The Rise and Fall of a Cosmic Order Around the 14th century of the Common Era, in what's today the highlands of central Mexico, there were numerous indigenous kingdoms and city-states, most of which were Nahua, meaning that they were speakers of the Nahuatl language. Although these states were mostly multi-ethnic, being home of many non nahua peoples like Otomi, Masawa and other Otomangian peoples. The Nahua polities located in the north of the Mexican plateau, like Tenayocan, Azcapotzalco and Texcoco, claimed to be ruled by descendants of Chichimeca rivals from the north, a land of hunters and warriors, while those further south claimed to be direct heirs of the old Toltec lineages like Colhuacán and Chalco. But what did they mean by that? Well, according to Mexican historian Federico Navarrete, this was originally a regional divide between those who hailed from the comparatively arid Bajío, where farming was seasonal and limited to lack of water, north of the Mexican plateau, and those who lived in the water-rich valleys of central Mexico. Those who hailed from the north were Chichimec, hunters, while those who hailed from the south were people from the Tula swamps, where Chinampas were built, in short, Toltecs. This was because the old cities known as Tolan, like Chicocotitlan and Chololan, got that name because of their link to wetlands where intensive agriculture needed to feed cities was practiced so their inhabitants were known as Toltecs. Although this term has a lot more historical and mythological baggage, which is explained in Ancient America's video. Again, please check it out after this video. So, the inhabitants of the north who move into the highland valleys, like those of Mexico and Tlaxcalan, bringing their culture of warriors and hunters with them, soon learn to live like their urbanite new neighbors, in a process colloquially known as Toltecization. But what's rarely discussed is that the self-proclaimed Toltec polities also underwent a parallel process of Chichimequization, in which they absorbed many elements from the Northerners' culture. Here we need to explain that the Toltec polities didn't see the Chichimec as savages, nor as inferior to them, just as foreigners with a different culture, which also had their own virtues under the Toltec canon. Also bear in mind that here I'm using Toltec to mean the old urbanites of the highlands and not with any other connotation. Also it needs to be said that those who self-identified as Toltec and recognized their Chichimec background often embraced both identities by donning the Tolteca Chichimeca label, showing how blurry the lines between the two sets of Nahua peoples came to be over time. After more than two centuries of cultural exchange between the Toltec Nahua peoples and their Chichimec brethren, it seems that what began as a loose demonym dichotomy used to distinguish two sets of related peoples started to morph into a cosmic concept. According to Mexican archaeologist Leonardo López Duján, the Chichimec began to be seen as bearers of youth and strength, as people whose natural ways were those of the conqueror, of the warrior, while the Toltec the Nahua urban highlanders came to be seen as the bearers of maturity and experience, people who had rich wisdom. The Chichimec would be the young ones, the ones with potential but lack of refinement and wisdom, <laughs> while the Toltec would be the elders, the wise ones, who know the ways to glory and prosperity but are now on their path to decadence. This view, which was also discussed by scholars like 
Michel Graulig, fits quite well in the cyclical cosmogony of the Nahua peoples, where everything, including societies, are part of a cosmic cycle of birth, growth, decay and rebirth, in which the history and fate of societies isn't defined in a linear manner as in the European worldview, but as part of a constant cosmic cycle of rebirth. However, even though the terms Toltec and Chichimec were mainly the heirloom of the Nahua peoples, some non Nahua, including some mystic polities and the Kichemaya, also claim to have some link to the Toltec. And some colonial sources also claim that the Purepecha rulers of Tsinsunsan were of Chichimeca descent, and others also designate the non Nahua Otomi as Chichimec, adding another set of confusing passages for both terms. Yet these claims would still have some affinity with the original concepts, although soon some new arrivals in Mesoamerica would adopt the terms and distort them beyond recognition. The Time of the Moors As I'm sure everyone knows at this point, the Spaniards showed up in Mesoamerica in 1519 and by 1522 they had toppled the most powerful Nahua state to ever exist, the Aztec Triple Alliance, this with the help of other Nahua peoples like the Yacolwa and the Tlaxcaltec, as well as non nahua allies like the Otomi and the Totonacs. The establishment of the Spanish authority in Tenochtitlan marked the start of a centuries-long series of campaigns to conquer and subjugate native peoples from Cholula to Nicaragua and from Guanajuato to New Mexico, as well as a long process to consolidate Spanish rule which implied a series of complex political, intellectual and military endeavors, as well as massive cultural shifts beginning with the introduction of Christianity and Greco-Roman legal thought. During this acculturation process, the Spaniards tried to improve their understanding of natives so they could devise more efficient policies and tactics to control their new subjects and this included adopting some native concepts and institutions and Europeanizing them for further use. And that was what happened to the concept of Chichimeca, which went from a complex ethno-cosmological concept, according to the pre-Columbian Nahua, to become a crude substitute for barbarian under the Spaniards. The projection of the concept of barbarian upon the concept of Chichimeca was originally a product of circumstance, as the peoples north of the Valley of Mexico were pretty difficult to bring under Spanish control, acquiring a reputation of sanguinary among the conquistadores, something that made the Spaniards immediately keen on comparing them with their old foes back in Iberia and North Africa, the Moors. The rise of the Castilian Kingdom as a regional power in Iberia in the 13th century, which would be the leading force in the unification of what came to be known as Spain, fueled expansionist sentiments against the remaining Muslim domains to the south, which led to the rise of a crusader mentality in order to justify their expansion. In this narrative, Castilians would see themselves as the harbingers of civilization in the true faith against the evil, barbarous infidels. And this was the mentality the conquistadores would bring to the new world in the 16th century. The non-Christian native to the north became the new Moor, the new infidel, the new barbarian. So eventually these terms came to be used as synonyms along with Chichimeca to describe natives north of the Mexican highlands and soon the idea of Toltec and Chichimec being equivalent to civilized and barbarian became ingrained among the intelligentsia in the new viceroyalty of New Spain, as proven by the works of Bernardino de Sahagún, which is the main source upon which most authors have kept basing their understanding of the Chichimeca as quote-unquote barbarians for centuries. With this new Osage, the term Chichimeca was retroactively applied to pre-colonial accounts and, more importantly, to the peoples further north of central Mexico that would keep resisting the Spanish expansion for the next centuries, the vast majority of which had never been labeled as such by the Nahua. 
The Forgotten Frontier Between 1522 and 1550, the Spaniards and their indigenous allies kept pushing to the west and north of the Mexican Plateau, invading the Purépecha Empire, the Otomi and Huastec polities and the Teco kingdoms, as well as the lands of the Guamare Confederacy and other native nations. This advance by European and Mesoamerican settlers was met with fierce resistance by native peoples. Being particularly notable, the efforts of the Caxcan people, led by Tenamashle during the Mixed War from 1540 to 1542, and the resistance of the Jonas and Pami peoples, who managed to remain independent until the 1630s and kept revolting against the Spaniards until the 1720s. By 1550, Spanish explorers had reached the territory of what's today the Mexican state of Zacatecas where they found silver deposits, unleashing a silver rush that brought Spanish, Mestizo and Mesoamerican settlers into the lands of the Zacateco and Huachichil peoples. The newcomers would be tolerated at first to the recent news of the Kashkan defeat, but soon the settlers complete disregard for native livelihoods and more importantly, enslavement of locals would lead to conflict and a long cycle of raids, skirmishes and battles known as the Chichimeca War which would continue until 1592 began. In this conflict, the Zacateco and Huachichil would count with Kashkan and Pame support, while the Spaniards would bring in Purépecha, Otomi and Nahua troops. To the length and cruelty of this conflict, the name Chichimeca would become almost exclusively attached to the four nations of the native resistance in the Spanish lexicon, losing almost all traces of its original usage by this point. Ironically, the Nahua troops that fought for the Spaniards in this war would be the actual descendants of the historical Chichimeca, the ones who had built Azcapotzalco and once included the Aztec among them. After the Spaniards and the four Chichimeca nations signed a peace agreement in San Luis de la Paz in present-day Guanajuato, the Spaniards promised to stop the enslavement of local natives and to provide food relief to their communities in exchange of allowing the work of Spanish missionaries and the settlement of Tlaxcaltecs in Zacateco, Huachichil, Pame and Cascan lands. This was a peace that wouldn't last, as the Spaniards kept pushing native communities into further concessions and violence was never away, which gained the Bajia region the reputation of being a land of never-ending conflict, reputation which later extended to other places further north, like the province of New Vizcaya, the New Kingdom of León and New Mexico, among others. These territories would eventually be known as the Gran Chichimeca, in reference to the distorted name used by the Spaniards to designate the native peoples of the area, peoples whose livelihoods and cultures were as diverse as those of Europe and which lacked any real linguistic, cultural or ethnic unity, being their only commonality, the resistance against the Spanish invader. By 1720, after centuries of conflict and political maneuvers, most of what had come to be known as the Gran Chichimeca had come under Spanish control, with some autonomous indigenous peoples living under nominal totalage of Spain-backed religious orders as was the case of the aforementioned Pame and the Yaqui. The term Chichimeca by these days would have already morphed into a generic term for any particularly hostile natives met by the Spaniards, even applying it to peoples living way far from the Bajío, like the Huesto people in what's today South Carolina, who were called Chichimecos by Spaniards living in Florida. The last days of Spanish colonial domain over what's today Mexico saw the rise of the Comanche as a native power, as they began to expand outside of their homeland and push deep into New Spain, a situation that would continue and intensify after the Viceroyalty had been replaced by the newly established Mexican government in 1821. The fear caused by the Comanche raids which at some point reached the state of Querétaro in central Mexico, reinforced the old colonial prejudice against the native peoples of the north. 
leading to decades of Mexican academics and historians repeating the centuries-old narrative of, quote, barbarians attacking civilization, which played quite well into the racist views of native peoples held by Mexican intelligentsia in the 19th century, even decades after the Comanche had been militarily neutralized. This inherent contempt for natives clashed with the rise of Mexican nationalism in the 1850s, as some academics and politicians wanted to claim the legacy of the historical Aztec and the legends about Tolan for the new Mexican nation. But how to hold natives as savages while claiming their legacy as part of national pride? One of the many numbers of mental gymnastics devised by the Mexican intelligentsia was dividing natives into quote-unquote civilized and uncivilized, following the old colonial bastardization of Toltec and Chichimec. So Mexico would claim the Toltec legacy and claim to have brought civilization to the Chichimec, thus neglecting the study of northern peoples, deeming them as quote-unquote mere hunter-gatherers with no culture. Over time this view of the native peoples of Arid America came to be questioned, as archaeology in the Bajío and other places further north began to give experts a glimpse into the complexity of this region in pre-Columbian times, and by the 1990s the Mexican academia began to reevaluate its old ideas and postures about the peoples of the so-called Gran Chichimeca leading to greater understanding of this region. There's still a lot to learn about Arid America, and the debates about its relationship with Mesoamerica only grow more intense and complex as more archaeological, anthropological and historiographic work is done. But what about the Chichimec, the actual Chichimeca? The truth is that there is still a lot of work to do in order to finally decolonize our understanding of this concept just as we are now decolonizing our understanding of the peoples once incorrectly labeled as Chichimeca by the conquistadores, like the Jonas people, who are still regularly called Chichimecas today. I hope that one day Chichimeca stops being used as the crude substitute of barbarian that Sagun devised, and also that people stop buying into myths and new age nonsense made up around them so they can finally start looking again at the real Chichimeca, at the many peoples that once shared that cosmic distinction, at their history and their legacy. I want to thank Ancient Americas for joining me into making this wonderful collab, and I really recommend everyone to visit his channel and subscribe in case you haven't done so. And as always, thanks for watching this video everyone, this has been the Aztlan Historian, and I'll see you next time.